Hello, everyone, and thank you for taking a work break with us and joining today's webinar. I'm going to give it just a couple of seconds as people come in. Um, as you're coming in, make sure you switch that chat panel to all panelists and attendees. That way, a uh, lively chat can be happening throughout the course and everybody can see your comments. Once again, we'd like to thank you for taking that work break with us uh, and joining us for today's webinar. Uh, we will listen to Professor Michael Segrew's reflections on Thucydides, history of the Peloponnesian War, the first work of political science in Western tradition that offers tough-minded observations on the political order and change. We're going to give everybody a couple more minutes, moments to log in and get settled. Uh, while we do that, once again, change that uh, setting to all attendees and panelists, and also let us know where you're joining from today. We love to see uh, where people are from, states, countries, we do get people from all over the place. We are looking at today's webinar as a give and take discussion about the history of the Peloponnesian War and would love to hear all of the questions that Dr. Segrew's lecture may inspire. So today, I have the great pleasure once again to welcome Dr. Michael Segrew to our ongoing webinar series, Classics Revisited. I know some of you have been uh, to his previous lectures, but for those who haven't, a little bit of background on Dr. Segrew is he is a, a professor of history at Ave Maria University, a graduate of the Great Books program. He earned his BA in history from the University of Chicago and his MA, Masters of Philosophy and PhD in history from Columbia University. Prior to taking his position at Ave Maria University, Professor Segru taught at Princeton University, Columbia University, Johns Hopkins University, and many more. We are really honored to have him with us. I'm Christy Goebel, Global Marketing Specialist here at Biblioteca, and behind the scenes we have my colleague, uh, Marie Thurold, helping to make sure everything runs smoothly. We will be sharing the chat log with all attendees. So make sure you switch your settings to that all attendees and panelists so people can see your comments as well as uh, contribute to that conversation. If you have specific questions for the professor, please use the Q&A panel. You can use it throughout the lecture or definitely during our Q&A session. The like button helps float the most popular questions to the top. So please use that feature if you see similar questions or something you just want answered and want to hear his answers on. Once again, we are looking for that give and take discussion. It makes for such a lively debate um, near the end of this webinar and would love to hear all of the questions that his, uh, Dr. Segrew's lecture may inspire. With that, I don't wanna hold you guys off any longer. This is a great lecture. I've listened to it twice. It was actually the first lecture that we recorded with the professor, uh, but it's the third of our series. Um, and so we're gonna hand it over to Michael. As I just said, it is pre-recorded, uh, but he will be with us live at the end to take all questions. Enjoy the lecture. Well, it's a pleasure to be starting this re-examination of some old classic books. These are favorites of mine, and uh, in some ways they never go out of style, or if they do, they shouldn't. And today I'd like to start our discussion with an ancient historian, Thucydides, who wrote the Peloponnesian War, and it's a masterpiece, but regrettably he died before finishing it. And Thucydides was an Athenian general, and the Peloponnesian War, which he writes about, went from 431 to 404 BC, and the Athenians lost. And this is in some ways a shocking outcome because the Athenians were wealthy, they were cultured, they were very capable, capable but in some respects they were, well, too smart for their own good. And outsmarting themselves is what the Athenians ultimately did. So they push the envelope like a tragic hero does, and they eventually cause their own downfall. So the history of Athens during the Peloponnesian War is a sort of collective tragedy. A superior group of people, the Athenians, dare what had never been dared before, and through their own hubris, destroyed themselves. So 
Thucydides can be thought of as the first genuine uh, social scientist in the Western tradition. And what that means is he's going to leave out as much of the poetic references as he can. In other words, he doesn't believe in magic or in the uh, miraculous religious traditions that have been sold by the poets over the centuries. He wants facts and he doesn't allow for divine uh, influence on human affairs. The only significance he does accord religion is the fact that sometimes people's superstitions may influence the disposition of military results. Uh, for example, uh, there were generals who were superstitious that the flights of birds represented omens that were good or bad, and sometimes foolish generals made decisions on the basis of omens. And he simply says, well, that's important in considering how to deal with such an enemy, but he places no stock in it himself. Now, the first book of Thucydides' history is particularly noteworthy because he says, I'm writing a history for the ages. This is going to be permanently valuable because he thinks human nature doesn't change very much across space and time. And there, it seems to me that he may well be right. Some of the things he describes in his history and the passions that politics stirs up are actually uh, quite similar to things we see today. Um, he also says that he's only going to include facts in his history. And his, the first thing he wants to do is get rid of the uh, poetic tradition, which suggested that in the beginning there was a golden age, and then we declined to a silver age, and then to a, an iron or bronze age. And Thucydides says that's nonsense. It's straightforwardly backward. In other words, in ancient times, life was really primitive and dangerous. Uh, his description of life is very much like Hobbes' state of nature. So he says, look, civilization is a rare and fragile plant. We are lucky to have created the great thing that we have. And the problem is that our, we were so civilized, we outthought ourselves, we fooled ourselves, our hubris and our arrogance proved our undoing. So he says that the war was caused because of the rising fortunes and power of Athens and the established power of the Spartans. The Spartans were uh, noteworthy for their military prowess and on land, they were close to unbeatable man for man. Uh, on the other hand, they were not good sailors and they weren't especially capable at naval uh, engagements. The Athenians, on the other hand, were a naval people. So they excelled at naval engagements and um, weren't, weren't quite as good as the Spartans, generally speaking, uh, in land fighting. Now, Thucydides says the, the ostensible cause of the war was a conflict surrounding Corinth that both of the big powers got involved in. But he says that's not the real reason. And in some ways he's uh, prefiguring what Machiavelli would say many centuries later, that if you want to have a war, you can always find a reason. As far as I know in history, no war has ever failed to start because no one could think of a pretext. So Thucydides says, look, it's easy to start a war if you want to. And the Spartans decided that Athens was getting too big and too strong it was getting more dangerous by the day, and they were going to have to fight them sooner or later. So the Spartans decided to issue an ultimatum to the Athenians, and that caused the war to commence. So it's an inherently unstable situation, uh, a, a long established power facing an up and coming dangerous power. All right. Um, he was a participant in many of these events. So he can report what happened. But for the speeches and decisions that he wasn't present for, um, what he did was substitute speeches that he wrote. Now, this sounds arbitrary. And it's not arbitrary, but it's not in keeping with what we would consider historical uh, evidence today. The standards were lower back then, well, because it had to be worked out. 
But it's worth remembering Thucydides was educated by sophists, and so were the elites throughout the Greek world, and that meant that they all learned rhetoric in the same way. And so when given a situation, trying to work out some diplomatic duel or create a truce or something, they had a set of stock forms that they would just fill in with the details. And so Thucydides wasn't actually stretching the truth too far when he just constructed speeches for both sides, arguing their point. And since he knows the outcome, he can always make one speech stronger than the other. So it's a kind of combination of art, uh, borrowing from Greek drama and from Greek rhetoric, but it's also uh, a science too, because he knows what had to have been said. Now, uh, the things that he talks about, the topics, are uh, of very great importance in understanding Athens, uh, which is, of course, the center of Greek culture. Pericles' funeral oration, for example, is a kind of encomium on Athens. An encomium is a speech of praise, and it's early in the war. A lot of young men have lost their lives. Their bodies have been brought back. And, Thuc and Thucydides puts in Pericles' mouth, because he's an admirable speaker and politician, uh, a justification for Athenian rule and for Athenian culture and for Athenian greatness. And he is a wise ruler because as Thucydides represents him, he is a king in, in all but name. Despite the fact that it's a democracy, he can persuade the crowd uh, in wise directions. So Thucydides, uh, or, or rather Pericles funeral oration, is a very fine piece of work, very similar in, so, uh, in situation and in content to Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. In both cases, you had heads of state of democratic regimes trying to justify the bloodshed and sacrifice that was inevitably a part of fighting to maintain their society. So both Lincoln and Pericles had to create uh, a justification for the honored dead before them and a justification for the future sacrifices which inevitably were going to be made. Now, it's very interesting that right after the, the funeral oration, Pericles, or rather, uh, Pericles' idealized city becomes only too real. Thucydides then recounts the plague in Athens. And the plague was devastating, not just to Athens, but to all of Greece. And it wasn't certain what exactly caused epidemics. If you look back at the Iliad, book one, you'll find the most primitive account of what causes epidemics, which is um, disrespecting the gods. On the other hand, um, that had largely become an old fashioned view. The new scientific view was that uh, nature wasn't populated by thing, by people, but rather, the, rather by, wasn't populated by spirits, but rather by things. And the new science that emerged a century or so before Thucydides influenced the development of his social science. He applied this new non-mythological outlook to the social sciences. And what he came what, up with was what he called a, a history for the ages. He thought that human nature being what it is, unchanging, and history being cyclical, uh, sooner or later, people would find themselves back in this situation. And what he had to say was very different from what Homer said in the Iliad. He said, it didn't make any difference whether you went to the temple and sacrificed animals or not. The old fashioned accounts have nothing to do with what causes epidemics. Uh, he got the epidemic and he said that the strongest were lucky to survive, most did not. And he was purely rational rather than mythological about the causes of the epidemic. Now, Thucydides also talks about civil war. And the civil war in Corsaira is one of the most frightening uh, events that uh, Thucydides narrates. And what he says is, 
Words change their ordinary meanings, and as a result, people could no longer communicate, trust broke down, and two factions, the rich and the poor, which were backed by Athens and Sparta. Uh, Sparta supported the rich, the oligarchs. Athens supported the poor, the Democrats. And as a kind of, cl as a kind of uh, client war, both sides helped Corsaira destroy itself. At the end of the Civil War, the entire city had been destroyed. Almost everyone was dead and no one survived the collapse of political order. So the danger here is that we take political order for granted. It is fragile. It is evanescent. It requires that we have trust in other people. If you don't have a shared sense of community, um, it's easy for a destructive uh, pattern to emerge and grow. Uh, the destruction and horror of war is uh, encapsulated in Thucydides' Melian dialogue. And this is perhaps the most famous portion of the book. Um, Thucydides talks about uh, the island of Milos, which is broken away from Athenian domination. And instead of paying tribute to the Athenians in a kind of shakedown scheme, They've decided they like to be the Athenians' friends and equals and not pay them anything. So the Athenians land a large army there, and they go in and talk to the city elders. And the dialogue, which Thucydides didn't see, but he, which he understood, was between the city elders arguing about ethics and religion and morality and virtue, and the Athenians pointing out that none of that mattered because they had a much bigger army and that if any such nonsense prevailed, uh, everybody in Milos was going to be killed. The Melian said, well, couldn't we get you to, you know, treat us fairly and rightly? Uh, you never know, our friends, the Spartans might help out. And the Athenians said, look, hope is not a virtue. Hope is going to get you killed. The Spartans aren't going to get you out, there, out of this. Nobody's going to get you out of this. So either surrender unconditionally, or we are going to lay siege we are going to break through, and then we are going to kill everyone in the city. Well, the Melians didn't have a good choice. Both choices were bad. So what could they do except decide that they were going to fight it out? They tried, but of course they succumbed to the superior military power of the Athenians. The Athenians broke through. They killed every Athenian man, every, every Melian male. The women were raped and sold into slavery along with the children. And then when the city was completely empty, 500 new Athenian uh, colonists came and then there were no more Melians. So if you go to the UN now and you look around at the desks of the various countries, there's no desk for Melos because they're all dead. And Thucydides wants you to take this into account in your political calculations. This is what Bismarck called real polity. Big fish eat little fish. Hawks eat sparrows. They don't feel bad about it. Thucydides says, look, it's just different kind of predation. And this is the way the world of politics and war really works. Finally, the book ends without a completion because Thucydides dies. And uh, one short part that he puts in, in some ways, captures the horror of the book for me. Um, some Thracians, who the Greeks would have regarded as barbarians, tried to join in the Peloponnesian fight on one side or another. They landed at uh, a Greek city-state but there was no one there to fight. They had not gotten the right information, but they had come with the intention of killing things. So they looked around and what they found first was a schoolhouse full of teachers and schoolboys, and they massacred them. And then Thucydides just goes on with the story, the main point of the, the main story of the war. Um, that little vignette meant nothing militarily. It made no sense. It, achieved nothing. And yet what it meant is that 
a bunch of children and a couple of teachers got impaled and slashed to death. Welcome to war. Uh, I think this is one of the most insightful and thoughtful books. I think that there's an awful lot that we can learn from this. And a final note is worth considering. Uh, something called the Thucydides trap has been discussed in both Washington and Beijing of late. It's the inevitability or strong likelihood, at least, of war between an established hegemonic power like the U.S. and a rising power that wishes to be treated as an equal and demands respect in the case of China. It could, the situation itself could produce a war that nobody wants and that neither side would actually benefit from. Our technological amplification of military destruction makes the Thucydides trap far more dangerous now than it ever has been. I'd be happy to take questions from anybody that has them. All right, thank you so much for the lecture, Michael. If you could, and he's I am. ahead of me asking. There you go, hello, welcome. Hi. Uh, and thank you to those. Uh, we have a couple of questions that actually came in via the registration. So we're gonna start with some of those. Uh, if these questions inspire any of you to uh, ask questions throughout this question and answer period, please put them into the Q&A panel. We'd be happy to look at all questions that we have time for. So the very first one I found very interesting and I'm reading it off of my notes. So one second, I apologize for looking down. Um, I lost it. Oh, there we go. Uh, how did the Peloponnesian War affect the development of the classical world thereafter? And how much did it ultimately affect the balance of power in Greece? Well, it there was no longer a balance of power once the war was over, the Spartans had emerged victorious, but on the other hand, the amount of destruction that had been done was enormous. There was a loss of manpower and a loss of goods. Uh, also, there's the fact that the Spartans could take political leadership in Greece, but they were in no position to take cultural leadership in Greece. So the big problem is that uh, the Athenian experiment went awry and destroyed itself. Uh, I can explain how they did that. Pericles died and he was a good, a good ruler. After him came demagogues that were very bad rulers that persuaded the people to do foolish things. The most foolish thing they did was while fighting a war against the Spartans who are a formidable force, they decided that they were so much ahead and they succumbed to hubris that uh, Alcibiades, the Athenian, persuaded the population that this would be an opportune time to invade Sicily. Now, if you know anything about military matters, you never divide your forces unless it's an absolute necessity. Unifying your forces is what makes for victory. So Alcibiades told them, there's a great uh, island for us to take over. It'll be no problem because we've been doing so well against the Spartans. No one can stop us. And of course, hubris set in. Now, you have to remember back then, the art of cartography is still in its infancy. If you look back up behind me, I have a, an old map and the Greeks had even nothing like that. Okay. Um, they didn't realize, because you got to remember that everybody that's doing the voting, the citizens, they're illiterate. Um, they don't realize how big Sicily is. All right. So if you can, I mean, if you look at the size of Athens and you look at a map of the Med and you see how big Sicily is, um, they are in no position to do that. And they're particularly in no position to do it while they're fighting a war for their lives. But they decide to do that. It's a, the best example of hubris in the political world. The entire naval and army expedition that got sent to, uh, to Sicily got destroyed. And this left Athens essentially defenseless. And this is why they lost the war. They didn't lose the war because the Spartans won. They lost the war because they outsmarted themselves. Got it. Okay, we had a question come in as well as you mentioned that the Spartans were supporting the rich oligarchy while Athens was supporting the poor democracy. Wondering if that's your analysis or Thucydides? That's Thucydides. In other words, Thucydides says 
that all societies are either overtly or covertly, they have a separation, a, a, a chasm between rich and poor. And every society that wants to sustain itself is going to have to do what it can to bridge that chasm. Now, Thucydides says that the poor were Democrats because they wanted their, they wanted power. The rich were oligarchs. They wanted a more aristocratic form of government. And uh, it made sense that the Athenians would support the Democrats. And it also made sense that the Spartans would support anybody that was not supported by the Athenians. Okay. Um, kind of sticking along with that particular note, um, I, I had a question of, and you talked about the Civil War, obviously, and that essentially communication just broke down eventually, and factions, rich and poor, were, were emphasized and pitted against each other, um, of course, backed by Sparta and Athens, um, and that it, essentially an entire city's political system stopped working. Knowing what you know and what you've studied about to yeah, I say it all the time <laughs> and I can't say it out loud. I don't know why, but knowing what he wrote regarding the civil war and how worried are you that we are repeating ourselves, not only in the U S but in other regions of the world? Well, um, it's very dangerous to ask historians what they think is going to happen because they don't know any better than anybody else. If I actually did, I'd be investing in the stock market, but <laughs> as it turns out, okay. Um, I am very concerned about the state of the US. Um, I think that the antagonism and the uh, uh, backbiting has become so shrill and so uh, counterproductive that job one for the next administration when they come in in January is going to have to be to find some kind of reconciliation. If uh, the conflict, if the racial conflict, or the uh, ideological conflicts that we have in America continue, um, the potential is there for real danger. I don't think that civil war is a likely possibility. We tried that once, and I don't think nobody, anybody wants to go back to that. But an upsurge in political violence is entirely possible, like we saw in the 60s. And who knows where it leads. OK. Uh, sometimes we get a little more political, sometimes not. So I'll try to steer clear of some of those questions or at least field them in between other things. Uh, one of the questions that we have is how did the invasion of Sicily affect Sicily's culture and the Roman civilization? Well, Romans were, uh, at this time, the Romans aren't there, right? So Sicily was originally settled by Greek settlers. <clears throat> so at the time they're Greek speaking, and uh, it doesn't have anything to do with Rome because Rome has got us a couple of centuries to go before it begins. Or, I mean, it, it exists, but it's not uh, an important political or military uh, power at this point. The big power is in the Eastern Med, not the Western. Okay. Um, and then how much do you, sticking with Sicily, uh, how much do you feel the Sicilian exhibition was a collective hubris of the Athenians versus, oh, I'm gonna so butcher this, I apologize. Um, Alcibiades, Alcibiades. See, there we go, seeing okay. an opportunity to distract from his political problems and his individual hubris and rhetorical abilities. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, okay. Um, Alcibiades is a real piece of work. Um, he's a, there's nothing quite like him. He is a gifted orator. He comes from a prominent family. He's sort of a friend of Socrates, but Socrates tries to make him philosophical and Thucydides hates it, so he runs away from him, even though he has a powerful attraction to Socrates. Okay, it's, it's a complicated situation. If you wanna find out more about it, the place to go is, the, is Plato's Symposium. But um, Alcibiades is a good example of what happens if you raise people with a, a, in a moral vacuum, all right? And that's one of the possible outcomes that we see with the education provided by sophists. It's all about winning, not about being right. Alcibiades was given military honors that actually belonged to Socrates. Uh, they were both fighting uh, on the, the Athenian side in, in an earlier engagement. Socrates says, I'm not interested in medals. You can keep them. Give them to Thucydides. He really likes them. So they gave them to Thucydides. Thucydides, some years later, comes up and proposes the Sicilian expedition says that he's a decorated war hero, which he sort of is, but he didn't do anything to deserve it. 
and says he has really great ideas and that we'll all become rich and famous and wonderfully well off because the Spartans aren't a threat and Sicily is just there for the taking. Okay. He, before they go, he and his friends go on a wild drunk the night before they set sail for Sicily and they destroy the Herme. Herme are household gods that you see in uh, outside of townhouses or the analog of townhouses in, uh, in ancient Athens. And they, were, they had reduced things to the kind of essentials, which is what the Greeks are good at. There was a head and there was a penis. That's all you needed for Hermes, right? Now, what these guys did, Alcibiades at the head of a whole bunch of drunken revelers, they defaced and destroyed these household gods. So they were singing and vandalizing and generally acting stupid the night before, and they were hopelessly drunk. So they committed sacrilege. The next morning, they've, they have set sail for Sicily, and people came out and looked around and saw that the household gods had been destroyed. And they were wondering who could have done such an awful, horrifying thing, because they take these gods um, quite seriously. And it eventually comes out that Alcibiades is the ringleader and it's the whole bunch that just went to Sicily. So the, uh, the city gets together, they indict Alcibiades for sacrilege, which is a capital offense. And they send a ship to catch up with the Sicilian expedition and arrest him, bring him back for trial. Now, when they finally meet up, they're already in Sicily, right? And Alcibiades hears about this and he's nobody's fool, he skips. So he runs away from Sicily and runs away from his generalship and he goes to Sparta. And the Spartans are, his, are the enemies of Sicily, or rather the enemies of Athens, but he doesn't care. He says, look, I can give you all kinds of military information which will make it possible for you to conquer Athens. But if you do, I want you to make me ruler of Athens. So he's a turncoat, he's a traitor. And uh, the, the Spartans don't know quite what to do with him. Uh, he's, um, he's a real character and he's not a warlike figure like the Spartans admire. And they can't figure out why the Athenians would make a person like this general. But they said, look, we'll take his advice. And Sparta has, uh, it is ruled by ephors. There are two of them. One stays home and one goes with the army when they go out fighting every year. Um, when they come back after a year of campaigning against the Athenians, the uh, ephor who had been gone noted, came to note that his wife was pregnant. And he thought this very peculiar since he had been gone so many months, it would be impossible unless this were an immaculate conception. So the Spartans begin looking around saying, who would do so, such a crazy thing, which is sure to get you a wretched immediate death? Who would impregnate the wife of an ephor? <laughs> well, it turns out that while the Spartans were fighting Athens, he was trying to make sure that he impregnated this, the ephor's wife so that he's, his line would rule both Athens and Sparta. When the Spartans realized that he had turned on them too, he split again. This time he went to Persia and offered a chance for the Persians to invade Greece if they made him warlord of all of Greece. No one knows what happened to him then. We only hear that somebody killed him. <laughs> and no doubt he really had it coming. But this gives you a sense of how slippery and how morally irresolute Athens was. And uh, the connection between politics and ethics is very clear. Um. You answered most of someone's question. Uh, did his deserting uh, also influence the outcome of the war? Did it have any impact in the final outcome of the war? Or is he just kind of a character in that war of stuff that happened? He catalyzes the war because he comes up with this great idea, right? It's a catastrophic idea. Um, he doesn't stay for the catastrophe, but all of his, uh, all of the, soldiers that had landed in Sicily, they were either killed and, and those that were captured were put in an open air pit mine. And from there, um, they were eventually destroyed. Uh, they either killed themselves or were killed by the uh, Sicilian. So Athens lost most of its Navy and most of its army 
in an expedition it didn't have to undertake and which caused the Spartans to get the break that they needed to win the war. Got it. Um, and then we, we also mentioned Persia very quickly. Uh, so I'm gonna ask this question. Can you speak to the influence of Persian interest on the war efforts of both sides? Sure. Um, a generation earlier uh, in 490 and 480, the Persians had attempted to invade Greece. They had been stopped at Thermopylae by the Spartans and uh, the great naval battle, Salamis in 480, they were stopped by the Athenians. And ultimately that rolled back the Spartan danger. Now, the reason why that was important is that thereafter, the Greeks all thought it would be a good idea to maintain a standing army, but especially, especially a standing navy, because if you're gonna be invaded particularly by the if the Persians take another crack at it, you won't be able to build the ships in time to do the job. So you have to build the ships on an ongoing basis and you have to man them. They have to be ready to go. So what Athens did was create what was called the Delian League, named after the island of Delos. And a whole bunch of islands got together with Athens, Greek islands, and they said, look, we're going to unite for common defense and we're all going to kick in... Uh, prorated amount of sailors and ships, and we will keep these in the Athenian harbor ready to go when they're needed. That worked for a couple of years, but eventually um, the people got tired of maintaining themselves on a war footing. It's expensive and nobody wants their sons off in Athens for a year doing God knows what. So many of the islands said, you know, we, we, we think maybe it's the time to disband this. We're not in danger anymore. But the Athenians had a better idea. And of course, that's what the Athenians do. They have better ideas. They say to these islanders, look, you don't have to send us your, soul, your sons. You don't have to send us ships. You send us a certain amount of money every year. We'll buy the ships and we'll hire mercenaries. And that way your sons don't get killed and we can still be safe. Well, that sounds good to begin with, but over time, it turns into a shakedown. It's a protection racket. They're not really in danger of being invaded, but when these city-states say, well, we'd like to end this now, we don't think we should send any more money to you, the Athenians say, um, we have a very big navy and we can help you change your mind if you want. So the Delian League was a giant protection racket. This funneled money from all through the uh, Eastern Med into, into Athens. And this is what the money Athens uses to build things like the Parthenon right? Or the Areopagus. In other words, the reason why they have such great statues and painting and architecture is because they're filthy rich. And they're filthy rich because they're getting paid to protect people from a non-existent threat. This is a big problem. And this causes many of the clients of Athens to want to side with the Spartans, but they're afraid to do so. On the other hand, once, once Athens destroys its own army and navy, you'll see a whole bunch of rebellions, and they won't be able to support, to uh, crush it the way they did with the island of Milos. Wonderful. Um, so quick question for you. Um, I think it's more of a clarification. It came in the chat. Um, first off, everybody, great questions coming in. Keep them coming. I love seeing so many questions coming in. Um, I have a Plato Symposium question mark. I'm guessing they okay. just want clarification as to what the Plato, Plato Symposium is. Plato Symposium is a dialogue because that's okay. what Plato writes. It's the second greatest dialogue ever written. And it ends with Alcibiades giving an encomium, a speech of praise about Socrates. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, okay, so the next question that I have is, if Thucydides died before the work was complete, how did it get published? Very, very straightforward question, I love it. Sure. Um, I assume that he made provisions for that. Uh, He's too smart a guy not to take into account contingencies. He's seen how uncertain the future can be. So given the fact that he's as realistic as he is and he's a practical man of affairs, um, I'm sure that Thucydides insisted that whatever he had be published after his death. Now, you can see the process by which he composes because in the last two books, which are the ones that, are, that he did last, the speeches haven't been put in yet. So what he did was write his history and then he'd go and put and write speeches to put into the mouths of the people that he was talking about. The last two books don't have the speeches yet. 
And the war hadn't ended when he died, but it, the writing was on the wall. It was very clear what was going to happen. Okay. And then kind of speaking, <clears throat> excuse me, along those lines is doing just a quick look and knowing that we've gotten this question the other two times. Do you have a translation you would recommend? I know that one has come up multiple times in my research is, is the Richard Crawley translation, but do you have another one uh, that you would Crawley's recommend? Crawley's as good as any. Okay. Um, what I would say about, I'm not so picky about translation, but this is something we're thinking about. Um, Thucydides is not for young people. I read it when I was 18 or 19 in college. And you know, all I wanted to know was, is this gonna be on the exam? I read it again when I was actually, I was on a, a yacht cruising the Aegean from island to island for three weeks. And all I did was I brought Thucydides with me and I read it slowly and carefully. The guy's a straight, straight ahead genius. Uh, he's a political scientist who is very, very aware of the uncertainty of human affairs and of the importance of force and uh, of the connection between politics and ethics and uh, what I might call physics, the simple facts of, of life. In other words, he, uh, Thucydides doesn't think about politics in terms of right and wrong. He thinks of it in terms of winners and losers big fish and little fish, hawks and sparrows. And he says, look, in the same way that nature doesn't feel bad about creating predatory animals, uh, human life means that some societies will end up being predatory and consuming the others. Uh, it's, all, it's all part of the same nature. Great. Uh, next question would be, to what extent does a sense of what we would call exceptionalism on, the other, on either side drive these parties down the path towards war? Well, I don't think there's much, I mean, well, Athens certainly thinks it's exceptional, right? Whether it deserved that or not, um, they, they didn't believe that the rules applied to them. Sparta, on the other hand, um, decided to become exceptional, exceptional, exceptional by focusing their entire society on war. They didn't have literature, they didn't have philosophy, they didn't have much in the way of architecture or sculpture. What they had was an extraordinarily powerful war machine because all young men were trained for war and nothing else. Women were expected to, to give birth to warriors and all of their farming, all of the craftsmanship, everything else was done by slaves that they had conquered. So Athen uh, Spartans didn't work at the arts and crafts, did not farm. All they did was war. And so they're an exceptional people because they think that that's what, uh, what politics ultimately amounts to. And the Athenians are exceptional people because as Pericles says in the funeral oration, we're very tough, we're good fighters, we're as good as the Spartans. But in addition to that, we're literate. We have poetry and philosophy and architecture, and we have all the things that make a city genuinely great besides blood and guts. Interesting. Um, kind of going on that, uh, Thucydides was a contemporary of Socrates. I believe they lived at about the same time period, a bit in Plato's early life as well, if I remember correctly. Uh, right. Both are famous philosophers that, that most people knowing Greek philosophy or even having not studied it know those names. Um, and, and all three kind of have started to look beyond those poets and, and doctrines of their gods and, and going into different uh, rhetoric and, and writing styles um, and, and really kind of focusing on more of the common man and overarching humanity. Noting what you said in the lecture about Thucydides not letting religion dictate his writings or actions, would you say that the thought process overall was starting to shift in Athens and Greece? Um, in, in a world away from the gods and more religious doctrine and more into the mankind and humanity? That's a great question. And it's a, the answer is kind of elaborate, but it's worth thinking about. All right. Pericle in Athens. This is fourth century Athens. Okay. Oh, no, actually fifth century Athens. Fifth century, yeah. Fifth century, right. Pericle in Athens, fifth century. Um, they have uh, a flowering of drama. So we get the great tragic writers, we get the great comic writers. We're gonna get some great historians. We're also gonna get great architecture. Like the, uh, we're also gonna get great statues and painting. In other words, every kind of culture flourishes in Athens. And that's important, but 
it's important also to notice what was happening in a set the century before that. Here I'm talking about the sixth century in Ionia. The Ionia is the little islands between Turkey and Greece. Okay. What they put together there was the world's first scientific revolution. It was uh, led by a man named Thales. He had some uh, some uh, followers named Anaximander and Anaximenes. And then there was a whole bunch that came after that, like Empedocles and Democritus. The point here, though, is this. What these scientists did was create the first non-mythological account of nature. In other words, back at the time of, uh, of say, Homer, uh, the sun was Apollo's golden chariot. Mm -hmm. And as long as you believe that, society could hold together. But uh, a scientist named Anaxagoras came up with the idea that the sun is not go Apollo's golden chariot, but rather that it's a hot rock. Now, you may wonder what the difference is, why that makes any difference. Well, here's the thing. If the sun is Apollo's golden chariot, when you get sworn in to give testimony at a Greek court, you'll be sworn in not on the Bible because that doesn't exist yet. You'll be sworn in on Apollo's golden chariot. Now Apollo sees all and knows all. And at the end of every day, he goes back to Mount Olympus and tells Zeus who's been naughty and who's been nice, particularly those that have perjured themselves. And if you believe in that myth, you will tell the truth when you give testimony. Now, once you get educated by Anaxagoras, and he tells you that the sun is a hot rock, what, what that means is that the hot rock doesn't care whether you tell the truth or not. This is what the sophists are teaching. The sophists have taken this new science, which demythologized the world, and correspondingly, the sophists demythologized the social world. There's no good and evil. It's just big fish and little fish. It's not an accident that Thucydides was educated by sophists. Hmm. That's really, I, I didn't know his history. So that, that adds on to that. Thank you for that. I'm kind of getting more into the nitty gritty, a couple more questions coming into the nitty gritty of the actual book and uh, Thucydides writing of it. What was the effect of the plague in Athens on the war? Oh, well, it came and it went. So it didn't have a permanent effect on the war, but the year that it arrived, uh, the Athenians had to minimize their operations and try and hold their society together. They had built a wall around their city, and that was a big uh, that was a big element in keeping the Spartans out. Um, on the other hand, that also gave, had given the Spartans uh, a sense of false pride. One of the remarkable things about Sparta is that although they had plenty of time to do so and plenty of enemies, they thought about it and then decided not to build a wall around their city. They said, if there's anybody that wants to invade our city, uh, we don't need a wall. Come with us and let's dance and we'll kill every mother's son of you. <laughs> so not having a wall was a mark of pride for the Spartans and it was a mark of safety for the Athenians. Okay. Um, and then do you believe that Thucydides' allegiance to Athens biased his work? Um, it couldn't help but bias it. And yet I think that, he, that one of the things that makes this such an impressive work is that he's doing his best not to demonize the other side. In other words, they're just people engaged in uh, conflict like his side. And so he treats uh, Spartan leaders like Brasidas very well, and he, treat, and he shows them to be more than capable military men. And that kind of leads into another question that we had received during registration. We, we open it up to questions that they might want answered. Um, and, and that is how accurate is Thucydides, is Thucydides' version of the war. Um, and I think I also asked one uh, in my notes of, you, you know, you, you've mentioned that it, it's history as it's known at the time, but not necessarily as we know it now in, in historical facts. So how accurate would you say this would be or that we know of? It's a tricky question. Um, usually among the ancients, the numbers are the first thing to get dodgy. Okay, in other words, uh, a thousand means a lot and 10,000 means a, a whole bunch. It's not like they actually counted these guys out, right? So uh, my sense is, is that when there's a, a deviation from fact, it's usually in the direction of exaggeration. 
but I don't think that any non-factual things have been put into the history. In other words, I don't think that, uh, well, Thucydides never has any of the gods and goddesses come down and help people out. Uh, he, he is looking strictly for this worldly causes and effects. And uh, I'm inclined to think that uh, he does as good a job as you could hope before we had things like computers to tell us how many guys we got in the army. So he gives you rough general numbers, but all the events, all the, the fighting that happened, that actually happened. Then, um, so we have a few more minutes if people do have more questions. I have a number of questions, so I'm gonna keep going because I'm finding this interesting, but please uh, put any questions you may have. So is this book then, in your opinion, more uh, Thucydides teaching politics in general uh, thought process or more, more him trying to just give a historical uh, account of the war? Well, since Thucydides thinks that human nature doesn't change, and he also thinks that time is cyclical. What he says in book one is that when similar circumstances come around, when the cycle continues, um, when people find themselves under the same circumstances, they're gonna do the same things mm -hmm. because human nature is more or less unchanging. This is part of the reason why um, the, the Thucydides trap has been of such concern in both Washington and Beijing. I assume that in Washington, many of the people there have gotten an, a classical education, so they know who Thucydides is, so they don't have a problem understanding what the, the issue is. I'm also confident that there are people working for the Chinese government who are trying to figure out the mindset of Washington policymakers who came upon Thucydides and were impressed at how much there was to learn from this. Uh, so I mean, remember Thucydides is about, I mean, roughly about the same time as uh, Confucius. So mm -hmm. this is an old book, which has stood the test of time. And both the Americans and the Chinese have good reason to, to respect that. Great. Uh, we have a few more questions. Uh, when we were first, uh, when you and I were first discussing the book, and we actually put this on our website as part of the description, uh, you mentioned that students beginning graduate studies in international relations usually begin their reading with Thucydides. Is it taught as what not to do, what to do, or an overreaching lesson of war and mankind? Well, generally speaking, if you go to graduate school in IR, one of the first readings you're going to get is the Melian dialogue from Thucydides. And this is, will be your introduction to power politics. Realpolitik did not begin with Bismarck. It has been around since war and politics has w w existed at all. Certainly it's 5,000 years old. The first good, solid, uh, rational account of power politics comes from Thucydides. What he says is, is that ultimately, the fate of nations is not determined by religion. It's not determined by the gods. It's not determined by fate. It's determined by human beings and their ability to apply force. So it turns out that uh, like the Homeric poems, the main theme of Thucydides is war, but this is a non-mythological account of war. This is a scientific account. And if we assume that politics is uh, an attempt to create social order and social advantage. If you look at what happened to the Melians when they all get killed and all the women and children are sold into slavery, well, um, whatever we're trying to do in politics, that's not it, mm -hmm. right? So this is what we're not to do. And the fact that this is not a moral conflict, but rather a conflict simply of one power against another, tells you the limit, gives you a sense of the limitations of morality when it's applied to politics. This is one of the most difficult problems uh, both then and now. And there's a good argument to make that Plato's Republic is an attempt to rejoin that connection between politics and ethics that we had lost during the Peloponnesian War. Well, I know that one of the things I took note originally was that, you know, it sounds like an aged thought and actually we just got a comment in, in our chat panel that's similar to this is that it sounds like an aged age thought that, you know, it, it, Athenian thought that that he, mankind doesn't change all of that stuff. But, but when we look at human nature, not technology, knowledge, 
the things we've discovered since, but just actual human nature, we still utilize the term history always repeats itself. Like it, it is there, the morals and human nature haven't necessarily always caught up to those technological advances that the rest of, you know, that the mindset of mankind has made, the, the, the emotions of, of human is human nature. And that still seems to be the same as it was 5,000 years ago. That's a very powerful insight. I mean, I can't argue with that. Um, one of the great problems of our age is the fact that our technical abilities have greatly outstripped our moral understanding. We can do a tremendous number of things that we couldn't do before, like destroy entire cities. Um, but our capacity to restrain our aggressive impulses, while thank God we haven't used nukes since the Second World War, but our capacity is always dodgy and always uncertain. You know, uh, you look at, 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 the, at the big actors, they have a reason not to, but they still stockpile nuclear weapons. I heard a joke once in a history department seminar, a uh, guy said he didn't want to buy any more nuclear weapons until we use the ones we have. And uh, I kind of feel like we don't stockpile nuclear or any kind of weapon with the intention of not using it. Mm -hmm. And so while I think the Russians or the Chinese or the Americans are likely to be responsible in the deployment of nukes, it's the small actors like Iran or North Korea that could be the fly in the ointment. They could break that. And uh, who knows what happens once we break that through that threshold once again. Uh, so, good. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. Finish well, up. No, I mean, we live in very dangerous times and uh, the complexities of technology have amplified the capacities of human beings, both for good and for evil. And the problem is, of course, that while we can do great good and have done great good, uh, I think that the progress of the last couple of hundred years has been genuine. Look at what the West has done. These are two, there are two great achievements. One is the abolition of slavery, and the other is the, is the emancipation of women. And those are genuine achievements that couldn't have been done in the ancient world. That's only possible in modernity once we get to the age of the machine. But um, apart from things like that, from achievements like that, which show the good side of human nature, there's always the, the downside of human nature that shows the potential for destruction and aggression. If you look at the Second World War, there's 60 million casualties. Um, that's a number unthinkable in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. So uh, our capacities get larger, both for better and for worse. Well, that's a great note to actually end on uh great thoughts and and everything i i appreciate it marie has shared some links with our uh chat uh including please if you want to see more lectures uh by by michael uh that he does have a youtube channel of some lectures that he did in the past i highly recommend you take a look at that so thank you again michael for you, joining us today it was a great conversation very interesting actually this was the least uh book I was the most familiar with. So it was kind of exciting for me to do some research on it and listen to your lectures and get a chance to talk with you today um, and take this break with an Athenian. Thank you. Um, if you are enjoying the Classics Revisited series with Professor uh, Michael Segru, be sure to keep an eye on our website. We have three more titles that will be aired starting in mid-November. Uh, we're just getting those final finalized details up. The titles include Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian, Shakespeare's oh, Measure for Measure, and The Book of the Courtier by Castiglione. I think I said that right. I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> uh, Bibli what was that? We get it. It's all good. There you go. Biblioteca is also continuing to add to our virtual event lineup. And yesterday, we also started an education series with the Education Development Center. Um, our next webinar with them is November 12th. I highly recommend you uh, take a look at these. Uh, the next one will focus on social and emotional learning that is happening in libraries and deeper focus on STEM learning in December. Yesterday was how libraries are influencing that at home type learning and, and how we're working in the digital world. Also on October 27th, we will hear from the Munich Public Library in Germany and Laia Library and Archives in Denmark with visionary ideas and implementations around digital strategy and innovation in libraries. So a lot to see, a lot to watch. 
uh, please visit biblioteca.com forward slash events to register to join us. We also have all of our webinars, including the three that we've already done uh, with uh, the professor on our website uh, for on-demand viewing. Thank you and, all. Yeah, thank you. And as finally, as we finish up, we would love to uh, for everyone to complete a quick survey that will pop up on your screen as soon as you log off. Uh, if you, especially if you've enjoyed the work break with the classics, but we are always open to see how you are viewing these um, little breaks that we're giving you throughout your day. If you have questions, leave them in the follow up survey uh, and we'll take a look at those. And with that, from everyone at Biblioteca, thank you again, Michael. I really do appreciate our conversations. Thank you. And for you leading the lecture. Have a great right. day, everyone. How are we doing?